Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi headed to Asia tonight. That's as Chinese state media calls for her plane to be shot down if she crosses a so-called red line. The Biden administration changes course. Construction of the U.S.-Mexico border continues in Arizona. They say it's about safety. A win for healthcare workers defying vaccine mandates. Exemptions were denied, but a multi-million dollar settlement could change everything. Monkeypox emergencies are declared in New York State and San Francisco. Both are implementing special rules to tackle the spread. Is it considered unprofessional for physicians to speak publicly about their views on COVID-19? That may depend on which side of the debate they're on. What a geologist says about the major tax and climate deal that Senators Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin announced this week. U.S. and Russian officials talk about a possible deal to bring home Americans Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. But the reported arrangement would include the U.S. releasing a significant prisoner. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is headed to Asia tonight. She'll visit a number of allies in the region, but will not confirm whether she'll make a stop in Taiwan. The potential for a top U.S. official to visit the self-governing island provoked a stark warning this week from the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping told Biden in a phone call this week that, quote, if you play with fire, you get burned, continuing that he hopes the U.S. side can see this clearly. That's according to Chinese state-run news agencies. Republican Representative Michael McCall was invited to join Pelosi on her trip, but declined, citing as a scheduling conflict. McCall has repeatedly urged Pelosi to make the trip. And a Chinese state media figure tweeted today that the Chinese military should shoot down a plane carrying Pelosi if she visited Taiwan with a military escort. When asked about the threat, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre refused to comment on it and said the situation is only hypothetical for now. And the Democrat-controlled House today pushed through a bill to ban certain types of guns, including semi-automatic pistols and rifles, guns that Democrats are calling assault weapons. But Republicans say it's a mischaracterization and an effort to disarm citizens. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with the details. For the first time in two decades, Congress is taking up a bill to ban assault weapons. This is one of those votes that's not entirely split down party lines. There are some Republicans who are for this assault weapons ban, while some Democrats are against it. The so-called assault weapons ban of 2022 aims to make it a crime to import, sell, manufacture, transfer, or possess a semi-automatic assault weapon or a large capacity ammunition feeding device. It would also require gun dealers to conduct background checks before sales and transfers. I think the best, most important thing to do is to have background checks. That probably saves the most lives on the ongoing. The House bill does not confiscate guns or magazines from people, but Republicans say it's still a step too far. This bill would end the sale of some of the most popular rifles sold in America today, impacting the sporting industry and all, all of those who rely on it for their livelihood. The bill contains a long list of rifles, pistols and more that Democrats aim to ban. Democrats refer to guns like AR-15s as weapons of war. Uh, assault weapons, uh, in my view, are designed for one purpose. They're weapons of war to kill a lot of people quickly. A characterization that Republicans call an attempt to deliberately mislead Americans in order to pave a path for stripping law-abiding citizens of their right to own a gun. An AR-15 is a sporting rifle. It's a semi-automatic. It is not the kind of platform that is used by the military. It's not an M16. It's on M4. But again, the other side tries to use this to muddy the waters, confuse the American people, and to put all firearms in the same category. Now, this assault weapons ban is not going to pass the Senate, so it's largely symbolic. Another symbolic type of legislation that the House is working on right now are public safety measures. So House Speaker Pelosi told reporters today that in August she 
plans to bring to the floor uh, legislation to grant more funding for police. As Democrats are trying to decouple themselves from the defund the police narratives with midterms just around the corner. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. When President Biden took office, he immediately stopped construction of former President Trump's border wall project, which had become a divisive topic in America. Now the Biden administration has authorized the wall's completion in some areas of Arizona. And TD's Jason Perry has that story. The Biden administration has authorized construction to close four gaps of the border wall near Yuma, Arizona. Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas explained why they decided to resume construction in a Thursday memo, saying, Due to the proximity of the Morelos Dam and the swift-moving Colorado River, this area presents safety and life hazard risks for migrants attempting to cross into the United States. He also said the Yuma sector poses a life and safety risk to first responders and agents who respond to incidents in the area. Andrew Arthur, a resident fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies, explained there are more risks to consider. You know, this is a national security risk. It's a law enforcement risk because drugs can easily flow across. When I was there, there weren't any agents around. I was there about six o'clock in the evening. Uh, and, you know, anyone could have easily traversed from Mexico back to Mexico uh, and brought whatever they wanted. He explained that most of the wall in the Yuma sector was actually built under the Obama administration. One thing to keep in mind is then Senator Biden, then Senator Obama, then Senator Hillary Clinton all voted for a piece of legislation called the Secure Fence Act of 2006 in September of 2006. It was a bill that I worked on when I was on Capitol Hill. And it called for uh, the installation of about 700 miles of border wall amongst high traffic areas at the southwest border. According to a new report by Senate Republicans, it cost taxpayers around $1.8 billion for contractors to guard unused construction materials since President Biden canceled Trump's border wall project. The Department of Homeland Security said it will move as quickly as possible, but it is still unclear when construction will begin. Jason Perry, NTD News. And now to vaccines. A class action lawsuit over the COVID-19 vaccine is coming to a close. Hundreds of medical workers have reached a settlement with the Chicago Health System, a system that denied their religious exemptions to the vaccine and fired many for turning it down. Christian organization Liberty Council announced the multi-million dollar settlement today. North Shore University Health System will pay out $10.3 million to compensate more than 500 health care workers. Some of them were fired and some are still employed at North Shore, but money's just a part of this deal. Those who were fired may work in North Shore's hospitals once again. That's because the health system says everyone who refused the vaccine for religious reasons and got the boot will be eligible for rehire. That's according to Liberty Council. North Shore agreed to keep an open, non-discriminatory religious exemption process in place. It's now up to federal court to approve or deny the settlement. And more in medical news, monkeypox emergencies have been declared on the east and west coasts. New York and San Francisco are trying to contain the viral disease as the number of cases is on the rise. San Francisco issued a local public health emergency, and New York State declared the virus an imminent threat to public health. New York's declaration allows local health departments to receive more funding. That's if other state and federal funds are maximized. San Francisco's mayor says the state of emergency speeds up emergency planning and allows for future reimbursement by state and federal governments. San Francisco has less than 300 cases out of about 800 in all of California. New York has over 1,300 more, more than 25 percent of all cases in the U.S. In total, there are less than 5,000 cases in the United States. And a doctor's association sued three medical boards for allegedly threatening physicians who've spoken out about pandemic policies. Did the boards violate the doctor's right to free speech? NTD's The Nation Speaks hears from the association's attorney. Physicians who don't agree with Dr. Anthony Fauci's policies on COVID have vocally expressed their opinions. And for that, they received letters from medical boards warning them their certifications could be revoked 
On July 12, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons Education Foundation, known as AAPS, filed a lawsuit against three medical specialty boards. The lawsuit alleges the boards threatened the doctors' free speech rights. In an interview with NTD's The Nation Speaks, AAPS attorney Andy Schlafly said the letters accuse the physicians of misinformation, but they're not specific. There's no evidence of any falsehood to anything these physicians have said. So these sort of general allegations against these physicians, and then it's a demand that the physicians prove that they're innocent. In a statement about the lawsuit, AAPS said the threatened physicians are countering disinformation by telling the public about the harm of lockdowns and the adverse effects of the COVID vaccine. Schlafly also pointed out that the letters were all sent around the same time. And it's apparent that these organizations are coordinating their efforts with each other or with the Biden administration because there's just too much copy and paste in the letters. <clears throat> They're not letters that are individual that were written from scratch for each physician. There's still a question about whether it's a coordinated effort or not, but there are other medical boards sending out similar letters. In February, NTD spoke to Dr. William Ray Lynch, a Georgia physician certified by the American Board of Emergency Medicine. Lynch said he was under investigation for making statements at a school board meeting. Vaccines do not stop the spread or prevent infections. Lynch made other statements about COVID-19, vaccines, and masks. The AAPS said in its statement that physicians have also been warned not to make public statements against abortion and contraception. We reached out to the medical boards, but we didn't hear back before broadcast time. Meanwhile, the lawsuit is asking a federal court to order these boards to stop retaliating against physicians. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And you can catch the full interview on The Nation Speaks with Cindy Drucker at 11 a.m. on Saturday, right here on NTD. And in climate change news, that funding package Senator Joe Manchin had abstained from supporting this week won his vote. In a surprise turn of events, Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced that the bill, worth $369 billion, aims to, among other things, cut U.S. carbon emissions by 40 percent by 2030. If it's passed, it will be the largest climate investment in U.S. history. The bill also targets inflation and health care. It's taken more than a year of negotiations. Will it help solve the nation's problems? Earlier today, I spoke with Gregory Wrightstone, a geologist and the executive director of the CO2 Coalition, to learn more about the environmental aspects of this bill. Gregory Wrightstone, welcome to our show. Well, thanks for having me. Glad to be on. I'd like to start by getting your take on this bill. Senator Schumer says it would cut carbon emissions by 40 percent by 2030. Your thoughts? Well, 40 percent is highly unlikely. We've only reduced it by about uh, much less than half of that amount uh, through all the efforts we've had here over the last several decades. Uh, but let's, let's just see what, even if they could do, what would that do to man-made global warming? Using the IPCC's own calculations uh, of warming and CO2 as a warming effect, if we reduce, the United States reduced 40% of our emissions, it would only avert, now you ready for this? two hundredths of a degree center, two hundredths of a degree, and that's by the year 2050, so by the year 2030, uh, it's probably closer to one one hundredth of a degree of warming. Is that worth spending $600 billion to avert? I don't think so, and, and chances are they won't because any reductions we make uh, will be increased, will be offset by huge increases in China, India, and Brazil. And if the bill were to pass, how could the emissions cutting policies impact low and middle income Americans? Well, they're, these, these things are, are designed, what they're doing is intentional, they want need to intentionally increase energy costs, electricity, gasoline. This is, this is the plan, and the plan is to increase those electricity costs in order to make renewable, and that's electricity costs and energy costs from fossil fuels, it makes the renewables uh, from uh, not so much hydro, but mainly wind and solar, it makes them look artificially attractive. 
And how will it impact people? It hurts the poorest among us the most. They claim to care for uh, the poorest and those on fixed incomes, but they'll be the ones most impacted by these high prices because the poorest and those on fixed incomes pay a higher percentage of their income on energy, as do the rest of us. And you've argued that carbon is vilified, that it actually does a lot of good for the planet. What's led you to believe that there's no climate crisis? Look out the window. We can see that the vegetation, and it's documented by NASA and NOAA, vegetation from the poles to the equator has been greatly expanding. Crops are breaking records, and it's partly due to increasing CO2. CO2 is, a, of course, if you remember back uh, to middle school in photosynthesis, you probably had a plant on the window sh on the windowsill, and you learned about photosynthesis. It needs sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, and the more carbon dioxide, the better. And so if you look at almost every country in the world, uh, from the coldest to the warmest, all of these countries are breaking crop growth records. And it's a combination of modest warming and increasing CO2. The warming means longer growing seasons. The key, and that's turbocharged by what we call the CO2 fertilization effect. So we see by just about every metric we look at uh, that, that the Earth's ecosystems are thriving and prospering. It's just opposite of what you're your viewers are being told. What would a carbon emission-free society look like? Well, that's easy. I, it's three words, cold, dark, and hungry. That's, that's the result of, of that. Uh, the burning and use of fossil fuels uh, has enabled us to uh, multiply population over the last 100 plus years by uh, eight times uh, the human condition has improved tremendously because of fossil fuel use. Uh, they're trying to take us back. And what we'll look like will be regular blackouts and brownouts. We're, we're seeing it across the world. Uh, they're demonizing now nitrogen for fertilizer. Uh, it's, it, would be, it would be a not too welcome uh, excursion back into the past uh, when we're living in cabins and burning wood. Many governments, including ours, are putting in place more climate change policies. What do you think should be done to ensure that our economy is strong while also eliminating bad emissions? Well, when we talk about bad emissions, uh, we don't consider carbon dioxide to be a pollutant. It was wrongly uh, judged to be a pollutant. In fact, if you look in the back of my SUV, I've got a, a bumper sticker that says, I heart CO2, and we do, and you should too. Uh, if we look at the at actual the bad, the, the true pollutants, uh, if, you, if you go to the EPA website, go to uh, the EPA website, Google that EPA and pollution, see what you find there. And what you'll find there is a chart going back to, I think it's 1960, uh, showing the decline of the eight major uh, air pollutants in the world. And, and it's just a tremendous decline. It's still declining, but it's getting harder and harder to take those last parts per billion out of the atmosphere. Our air and water are today cleaner than they likely have been since the Industrial Revolution. And we should celebrate that. That's a very good thing. Uh, but carbon dioxide is not one of those pollutants. Again, we view it as, as the, we call it the miracle molecule. They're calling it the demon molecule. And we should celebrate that. Gregory Wrightstone, geologist and executive director of the CO2 Coalition, thank you for your time. Thank you. Coming up, the death toll continues to rise following devastating floods in Kentucky. What Governor Andy Bashir is saying. And in his first public appearance since Roe v. Wade was overturned, the Supreme Court justice who wrote the abortion opinion called out foreign leaders who've been criticizing American law. That and more coming up on NTD News. In every country communism gains power, authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. Communism promises a world without suffering, and yet, in its execution, does the exact opposite. Following Lenin's death, Stalin's 29-year reign killed an estimated 60 to 66 million people. More famines and purges would occur. The very peasants that communism was supposed to benefit 
instead starved to death under its rule. The party dictates what is right and wrong. Mao ended up killing between 50 million and 70 million people. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why. The death toll stands at 16 in Kentucky after historic floods swept through the region. But that number is expected to rise. Mike Valerio is in eastern Kentucky and has the latest. Our little room completely crushed. Devastation and destruction across eastern Kentucky on Friday as officials continue to look for survivors from this week's record flooding. I've certainly done three plus uh, flights and or tours uh, over flooded areas. This is by far the worst. Kentucky's Governor Andy Bashir laying out the difficult task ahead for rescue workers and for loved ones. Hundreds of homes, uh, their ball fields, their parks, uh, businesses um, under more water than I think any of us have ever seen uh, in that area. Absolutely impassable in, in uh, numerous spots. Several roads still remain underwater, making any type of rescue nearly impossible in some areas. Bridges washed away, thousands without power, and some residents forced to climb onto their roofs to wait for help. Today will be the sad day. In Hazard, Kentucky, the mayor says seven of the city's nine bridges were impassable as of Friday morning. You get stories, and you know it may be true, it may not be, but today, will the next three days will tell the tale. And more rainfall is on the way, with an additional one to three inches expected throughout the day on Friday, delivering yet another blow to the region. A man accused of raping and impregnating a nine-year-old Ohio girl will be held without bond. The judge announced the decision on Thursday, saying the girl shouldn't have to be around the alleged rapist. This man lived in the home with this child to allow him to return to that home, the traumatic and psychological impact would be undeserving to an alleged victim. If convicted, the alleged rapist, Gerson Fuentes, faces the possibility of life in prison with no chance of parole. He's from Guatemala and appears to be in the U.S. illegally, according to the judge. The judge said that he's, his possible penalty and the fact that he might be in the U.S. illegally make for a substantial flight risk. The county prosecutor said DNA testing of the aborted fetus confirmed Fuentes was the father. A detective said he couldn't find any evidence that Fuentes was in the country legally. The girl previously confirmed that Fuentes attacked her. When Fuentes was arrested earlier this month, he confessed to police that he raped the girl. And Samuel Alito, the Supreme Court justice who wrote the opinion to overturn Roe v. Wade, made his first appearance in the public since the ruling. He mocked foreign leaders who criticized the abortion decision. One of these was uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price. Alito said, quote, what really wounded him was when Prince Harry seemed to compare the abortion ruling to Russia's attack on Ukraine. Prince Harry also called the decision part of a global assault on democracy and freedom. Alito says he believes the decision he wrote is the first in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court that was, quote, lambasted by a whole string of foreign leaders who felt perfectly fine commenting on American law. Alito made his remarks in Italy where he gave a speech on religious liberty. The justice said that in Western countries, there's not only ignorance about religion, but also growing hostility against it, as well as against traditional religious beliefs. As a heat wave continues across the country, doctors and firefighters are warning parents and caregivers about kids falling from windows. Between 3,500 and 5,000 kids, usually between five and two years old, fall from windows annually in the United States. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. While her teenage stepson watched her young kids earlier this month, Chelsea Nelson took a short break in her adjacent bedroom. Then she heard a loud noise. 
and I just all of a sudden heard a loud bang. Um, and it was so loud that I, you know, instinctually I just had to go see what it was. Um, and my stepson, who's 15, was on our patio, and that's when he told me they had fallen. Um, and I just see them you know, off my balcony, you know, just laying lifeless on the ground. Her two-year-old Jamari and five-year-old Alavia had fallen from their third-story apartment. She rushed out in a panic. We ran down the stairs, and it was almost like a nightmare, you know, where like those staircases just feel like they're never ending. And for some reason, I just couldn't catch my footing, and I feel like I'm tripping down every step as I'm, you know, rushing down the stairs. She found her daughter unconscious and bloodied. Her son was knocked out, too. And just last week, a toddler died after falling 15 stories in Chicago. It's tragic, partly because the injuries can often be severe, even devastating, partly because families are so shaken up by it, most parents didn't realize that this is something that could even happen. In the Pacific Northwest, falls from windows spike in the summer. The region is facing temperatures in the 90s this week. Officials say steps to keep kids away from windows include getting stoppers so that a window doesn't open more than four inches, moving furniture away from windows, and constant supervision. I'm talking to anybody that will listen because I had no idea either. You know, I had no idea what a window stop was. I had no idea what window guards were. Days after their fall, both of Nelson's kids still have scratches healing on their faces, but she said they're mostly back to normal. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Shark sightings are on the rise along the New York shoreline, and at least three people have been bitten in the past month. Patrol boats, drones, and lifeguards are working to alert swimmers of any possible shark sightings. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Lieutenant Sean Riley is with the New York State Environmental Conservation Police. He explained what they look for on a patrol boat. Bunker is going to be the thing that's going to get our attention. Bunker up on the surface, that something's pushing them up there. And then we'll go by and try and see if we can verify what it is. Cleaner oceans, warmer water temperatures, and a resurgence of bunker fish that sharks feed on are seen as factors. Detection from drones to helicopters has also improved. They've had the sharks all the way in five, 10 feet of water, right you know, 20 feet off the beach in a couple places, but I wanna say it's normal for them to be that tight unless they're really chasing some schools of bait fish. A lifeguard with a drone on Long Island's Jones Beach captured footage of a large shark chasing a school of fish in early July. A great white shark carcass was removed from a Long Island beach earlier in the month. The shark was approximately six and a half feet in length and weighed about 250 pounds. Not to minimize the recent sighting, Lieutenant Riley noted people often mistake dolphins for sharks. See a dorsal fin on the surface. And the shark fin, dorsal fins usually gonna have the straight line on the back with a angle forward that may have some curve to it. The dolphins, their dorsal fins curve front and back. Experts say the increase in numbers of sharks is a sign that conservation efforts have succeeded. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, the FBI released statistics for active shooter incidents across the United States in 2021. NTD's David Lamb takes a look at the numbers, including what might be a surprising result based on state laws. And U.S. and Russian officials talked Friday about a possible deal to bring home Americans Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. NTD's Dave Martin asks a former federal prosecutor to weigh in on the reported proposal. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. I guarantee you they'll be the most comfortable sheets you'll ever own. I do not like my sheets. 
I love Mikey's a dream sheet. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you can buy one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or you can get my classic premium my pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com. Use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. Communism is evil. Come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. Navigating a world of economic madness you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why. What's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. The FBI issued a report listing all the active shooter incidents that occurred in the United States last year. California was leading the nation again with the most active shooter situations. NTD's David Lamb spoke to a criminal defense attorney on the matter. According to a recently published study, the FBI indicated a total of 61 active shooter incidents in the United States in 2021 that occurred across 30 states. In these incidents, 103 people were killed and 140 wounded. California, while having some of the most gun laws per state in the nation, also leads with the most shooting incidents, six. The six active shooter incidents in California killed nearly 20 victims and wounded nine. According to a criminal defense lawyer who has been practicing law for over 20 years, he's not surprised due to California's population. California is is where the street gangs were found. So there's a lot more guns, and I'm not talking about legal ones, I'm talking about illegal guns. Based on the FBI study, California has about 0.015 shootings per 100,000 people. By comparison, Texas, with almost no state gun laws, has just about the same ratio, 0.0167. Texas saw five active shooter situations, along with Georgia. Georgia had a ratio of 0 0.045. Nonetheless, California is continuing to push for further gun restrictions. A new California Senate Bill 918, which is on its way through the legislature, would ban the carrying of guns in most public areas, regardless if someone has a carry license or not. But Hashemi suggests a slightly different approach. He says the Second Amendment cannot be violated, but he hopes certain people would be restricted from owning a firearm. So what kind of changes would you like to see um, in, in California gun laws? That's, that's another good question. Um, I think California gun laws uh, are very strict. They could be a little bit more stricter. I think California needs to implement these background checks, but at the same time, make sure they don't infringe people's rights to their own. Hashemi says checking buyers for red flags for mental illness or mental medication is important. The FBI defines an active shooter as one or more people engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. While Hashemi says there is no easy answer to how gun laws should be handled, he hopes both sides can have open discussion meaning both sides need to come sit down and listen on, on what's going on. I know one side says we should ban guns and one side says that there should be no regulation, but there, there needs to be a meeting of the minds in the middle. So he added the importance of the Second Amendment is to give the civilians of the United States a check on the government. Nationwide, the number of incidents jumped up from previous years. Where there were 40 incidents in 2020, 
and around 30 incidents from 2017 to 2019. David Lamb, Entity News, California. For California's homelessness situation, some officials are proposing a solution known as tiny homes. And in the Bay Area, some residents are strongly opposed to them being built in their neighborhoods. And TD's Eileen Ang has why locals are pushing back. How we can know you guys are taking that seriously consideration, you know? San Jose residents are speaking out against tiny homes being built on an existing park in their noble Alum Rock neighborhood. Tiny homes are single room structures, often built in the hundreds, used to put a roof over homeless people's heads. One resident cited the risk of the proposed location. We don't want to take the risk of our parks being damaged or possibility of our children being harmed. So we want it relocated. Our, our stance on this, we feel for the homeless. We believe they have to have housing, but not in a neighborhood on a park next to a school. It needs to be on the outskirts or in an industrial area of some sort. It should not be on neighborhood parks and schools. The location is about a minute walk from Noble Elementary School, a children's playground, and a library. It's also a seven-minute walk from both Piedmont Middle School and Toyon Elementary School, as well as a 20-minute walk from a high school. The city is proposing to build 100 tiny homes in the area. They're like a bunch of little sheds that you can buy at Costco, basically, and they're, they're putting them on sites and they're putting gated fences around them. And we hear they can have from either one to four people per home that we've been told. Just five years ago, they deemed that 17 houses weren't, weren't uh, it, it wasn't a good choice. Well, nothing's changed in the, seven, in the five years, except the number of houses that they want to build. Residents worry that if the tiny homes are built, it would attract more homeless people. We know they're not going to stay in their little, little tiny houses. They're going to be walking around. And we're not against homeless people, but we don't know what kind of homeless people we're going to get. And what has happened, the homeless that we see that people don't want their neighborhoods or they don't want that, they don't want the RVs broken down, the tents, dirtiness and people hanging around and possible drug use. I live right on Penitentiary Creek. In the, there's a homeless community down there in tents. In the last five weeks, or yeah, or six weeks, there has been nothing, none less than five fires started by the homeless people right in the creek. You can verify it with the homeless, the, the fire department. They plan to protest at the San Jose City Council meeting next week. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. A growing number of Californians now live in wildfire danger zones, according to a July 28th report by Chapman University. Buildings more homes as a solution to the state's housing crisis may be putting more people in danger of wildfire. NTD's Daniel Hall reports. Using U.S. Census data, student researchers from Chapman University estimated nearly 13 percent of California's population lives in at-risk areas for wildfire. Postdoctoral researcher and project mentor Shen Yue Jia pointed to rapid housing development as the cause for the increase. She said, in California, such pressures are largely driven by the increase of human populations and rapid real estate development in response to the housing crisis. Understanding which regions experienced significant population growth over the past decade can identify communities at greater risk of wildfire, especially when using the most recent demographic data. Contra Costa, Alameda, and Riverside counties saw the biggest jump in at-risk areas in the past decade. According to the study, Riverside has the highest number of residents living in housing tracts in the wildfire danger zones. Meanwhile, firefighters continued to make progress on the Oak Fire near Yosemite National Park this week. The fire has consumed more than 19,000 acres and was 45% contained as of Friday morning. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov Friday regarding a possible deal to bring home Americans Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Blinken revealed Wednesday that the U.S. had made an offer to Russia, and though no details were provided, many reports have named Russian arms dealer Viktor Bout as the one being offered. Blinken described the call as, quote, a frank and direct conversation. 
Griner has been detained since February for drug possession charges after Russian authorities say they found cannabis oil in her luggage at a Moscow airport. Griner has pled guilty to the charges, saying she accidentally packed it in her haste to board the plane. Whelan was arrested in Russia in 2018 and in 2020 was sentenced to 16 years hard labor on espionage charges. Meanwhile, Bout, nicknamed the Merchant of Death, was sentenced to 25 years in 2012 on terrorism charges. I talked to former federal prosecutor Nathan Williams about whether this is a fair trade. Williams says on one side of the equation, Griner's offense doesn't seem very serious and that we don't know enough about Whelan's. On the other side of that equation, we have a lot more knowledge um, about Bout because he went to trial, he had a full-blown domestic trial here in the U.S., and he was supporting terrorists. But Williams, who calls Bout one of the worst of the bad guys, also points out that Bout's already served more than a decade and says a trade is plausible. There's a lot of unknowns, but it, again, it's not uncommon for federal sentences to be reduced for a variety of reasons, and certainly um, bringing back Americans um, back to their country is, is, is a valid, I think, international and, and domestic um, reason to reduce sentences. While the U.S. waits on a resolution, Griner's next court date is scheduled for August 2nd. Former President Donald Trump played a round of golf yesterday at his home course, Trump National Golf Club Bedminster in New Jersey, the day before Live Golf's third event will be played there. Trump teed off with golfers Dustin Johnson and Bryson DeChambeau, who recently defected from the PGA to the upstart Live Golf League. Trump said the Saudi-funded league is creating a, quote, gold rush for players. He also said if there's a merger between Live Golf and the PGA Tour that, quote, the people who didn't come will never get anything except a thank you from the people who took advantage of them. Although nothing has been confirmed, reports have surfaced that both Dustin Johnson and Phil Mickelson received more than $100 million to switch leagues. More recently, Bubba Watson's move was for a reported $40 to $50 million. This weekend's event will be the second live event held in the U.S. and the first of two held on a Trump-owned course. There will also be a team championship played at his Miami course at the end of October. This year's PGA Championship was originally supposed to be held at Trump's Bedminster course, but was canceled last year following the events of January 6. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And breaking news on the Brittany Griner story, CNN is reporting that Russian officials are requesting a former colonel be added to the proposed deal to bring home Griner and Paul Whelan. Vadim Krasikov was convicted of murdering a former Chechen fighter in Berlin. Russian officials are requesting his release, along with convicted arms dealer Viktor Boot. Complicating the re request is the fact that Krasikov is serving his life sentence in Germany. And coming up, Chinese exports to Russia soar in 2022, including materials used in making military gear. The exports could be helping Russia prolong the war in Ukraine. And Chinese telecom company Huawei has come under the scrutiny of the FBI. It has to do with the location of some of its cell tower equipment. That and more when we come back. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week.
Dozens of Ukrainian prisoners of war appeared to have been killed on Friday when a prison building was destroyed in a missile strike. Moscow and Kyiv are accusing each other of carrying out the attack. The prison was located in a separatist region of eastern Ukraine and reportedly held Ukrainian prisoners of war captured after the fall of Mariupol. Some of the deaths were confirmed by Reuters journalists who were at the prison in Alenivka. Alenivka. Russian Defense Ministry said 40 prisoners were killed and 75 wounded in the attack. While a spokesman for the separatists put the death toll at 53 and accused Kyiv of targeting the prison with U.S.-made rockets. The Ukrainian military denied making any rocket or artillery strikes and accused the Russians of shelling the prison to cover up the alleged torture and execution of Ukrainians there. Neither claim could be independently verified. The attack overshadowed UN-backed efforts to restart grain shipments from Ukraine's Black Sea port. And China's support of Russia has raised concerns across the Western world. That's with Beijing ramping up its shipments of goods to Russia. Let's take a look. In the first half of 2022, Chinese microchip exports to Russia have doubled compared to last year. Now they're worth around 50 million U.S. dollars. What's more, shipments of printed circuits are soaring to double-digit percentage growth. Those parts are a significant component in making military gear, as well as a crucial material for weapons manufacturing and aerospace. Aluminum oxide shipments from China to Russia are also 400 times higher than last year. That's according to Chinese customs data. U.S. Ambassador to China Nicholas Burns last week emphasized the U.S. government's urging for China to stop supporting Russia. Since the beginning of the Ukraine war, Washington has repeatedly warned Beijing not to aid Russia's invasion. It's also made clear that if Beijing insists on supporting the country, China will face sanctions as well as Russia. Beijing denies supporting the war, though Chinese data reflects boosted oil and raw materials exports that may be helping continue the conflict. Last month, Washington just announced plans to add five Chinese companies to its trade blacklist. That's after they reportedly aided Moscow's military. On the Chinese side, Beijing refuses to call the Russian attack on Ukraine an invasion and blames the U.S. for the issue. Beyond that, Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping has said China and Russia's friendship has no limits. And Chinese tech company Huawei has long been the subject of U.S. government allegations that it could spy on U.S. customers. And now the FBI is focused on the placement of the company's cell tower equipment. Here's that story. Chinese telecom company Huawei is in the hot seat over some of its business decisions. An FBI investigation found that the company has a pattern of installing equipment on cell towers located near American military bases. What makes that a cause for suspicion? The towers are in rural areas where installing gear is not profitable for the company. So why install gear there? The FBI reportedly found that Huawei's equipment could technically disrupt American military communications. That includes highly restricted Defense Department communications used by U.S. Strategic Command, the force that oversees nuclear weapons. A recent CNN report highlighted the issue, but U.S. officials and experts have been raising similar concerns over Huawei for years. In a recent interview, Jonathan Pelson, author of the book Wireless Wars, said the Chinese telecom company is driven by motives other than profit. It was clearly not a coincidence because they were not making any money on these deployments. It was clearly a, a political and military move that they were that they were doing to put their cell tower equipment right around our most secure locations in the country. Huawei is believed to have extensive links to the Chinese Communist Party. And French President Emmanuel Macron hosted Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as part of increased Western efforts to court the major oil-producing state. But Macron has been criticized for inviting a man Western leaders believe ordered the murder of a prominent Saudi journalist. This report comes from NTD's Eddie Aitken. French President Emmanuel Macron welcomed Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for a dinner at his presidential palace. It marks another step in the Saudi leader's diplomatic rehabilitation, four years after the killing of US-based Saudi journalist and critic Jamal Khashoggi. The visit from the prince of the oil-rich state comes as France and other European nations are seeking to secure sources of energy to lessen their dependence on Russia. French opposition figures and human rights groups 
have criticised Macron for inviting the Crown Prince. US-based Democracy for the Arab World Now said it filed a complaint arguing that the Prince was an accomplice to the murder of Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. The group called on French authorities to open a criminal investigation into the Crown Prince. How on earth is Macron uh, or Biden going to persuade the whole world to stand behind Ukraine because of democracy, because of the rule of law, because they oppose uh, a war crimes like the ones Russia is carrying out when they are cuddling up and fist bumping um, with a, a brutal dictator and others like him in the Middle East. U.S. President Joe Biden was also heavily criticized within his own party for a recent visit to Saudi Arabia, including sharing a fist bump with the prince. The Elysee Palace said Macron would address human rights during the meeting without elaboration. Western intelligence determined that Prince Mohammed was complicit in the killing. The prince lost supporters in the West who were appalled and had previously been cheering his social reforms at home. Prince Mohammed maintains he had no knowledge of the operation, despite it being carried out by people who directly reported to him. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Up next, an iconic symbol of Paris is coming back. The French Culture Ministry has announced the famous Notre Dame Cathedral will reopen to the public in 2024. According to ancient Chinese medicine, purslane is considered a medicinal herb and is used to help lower cholesterol, improve vascular functions, and prevent diabetes. Perilla seeds can nourish the lungs and spleen. It is used to treat asthma and improve pulmonary functions. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perilla seeds from Huangmei Mountain in South Korea. It contains over 90% of omega-3, 6, 7, and 9 the highest concentration possible without chemical additives. The soft gel is made of natural seaweed. It is 100% organic and vegan. Both adults and children can take it with peace of mind. Ancient recipes were passed down from heaven to bring prosperity and longevity. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3 The Ministry of Culture in France has released a first date at which the famous Notre Dame Cathedral will reopen to the public. The construction and restoration works in the monument, after a destructive fire in 2019, are ongoing. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has more for us. The Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is on track to reopen to the public in 2024, more than three years after its roof was destroyed in a massive blaze. French culture minister Rima Abdulmalak said the cleanup phase of the restoration project had ended, allowing rebuilding work to get underway at the end of the summer. Covid has obviously slowed down the reconstruction of Notre Dame. However, the construction work is progressing fast. It's right on schedule. Notre Dame has been closed for restoration since the fire in 2019 gutted its roof and sent its spire crashing down. It was seen by horrified onlookers and people watching in France and around the world on television and social media. Soon after the blaze, operations took place to secure the building. This was the first major step before the reconstruction process and was completed last summer. The cathedral dates back to the 12th century. President Emmanuel Macron said it would be rebuilt and later promised to get it reopened by 2024, when France is set to host the Olympic Games. We are all pretty confident that the year 2024, which counts 365 days, will be the year of the completion of most of the site, at least of the opening of the cathedral for worship and for the public. The construction will continue after 2024, for sure. The cathedral will be restored to its previous design, including the 96-meter spire designed by architect Eugène Viollet-le-Duc more than 200 years ago, for which new timber has been selected. Since the fire, 340,000 donors across the world have given 844 million euros towards the cathedral's reconstruction, 
according to the public agency in charge of the work. The cause of the blaze still remains unknown. The French government say it was likely an accident caused by a short circuit, but it has not provided any evidence to support this conclusion. Other experts say it's the result of a criminal act. Whatever the case, the investigations are now over, which means it's not certain if the public will ever have a definitive answer to this question. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.